but Matthew chapter 28 at verses, verses 18 to 20. It's going to be a very interesting study tonight. I've entitled the message tonight, Christianity Go. And you'll see why in a moment. I know a lot of you guys are chuckling. You probably know where I'm going with it. But anyways, verse 18, let's read. It says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. How many of you have seen in the last few days people walking around in your community with their noses in their smartphone? Raise your hand. How many of you guys have seen that? A lot of you, right? Chances are that they were probably playing Pokemon Go. I'm serious. This thing has literally blown up. Let me give you some interesting things that are going on right now about this. It is the biggest mobile game in U.S. history. And with over 21 million active or daily active users in the U.S. That's a lot of people on this thing. And not only that, but it has attracted more users than Twitter. And it's really, really getting close to being more popular than Instagram and Facebook. This thing is just crazy. And it's said, too, that in July, 231 million people talked about Pokemon Go on Facebook, spurred a 1.1 billion interactions. That's huge. That is crazy to see something like this. So the question is, well, what is Pokemon Go? Some of you are like, what is that? Well, let me explain this to you. Let me take it for, I'm taking it from their website. This is what Pokemon Go is. It says, it's an amplified reality mobile game that places animated monsters in the real world. All players, also known as Pokemon trainers, need their smartphone to view into this world full of Pokemon. There's a picture that I want to show you of what, what that actually looks like from the actual, is there a picture? Do we have a picture? We don't have a picture? There it is. You see that? There's the real world in that phone, but you see that little thing right there? That's what they're going after. There's a variety of monsters. Now, this is not a lesson on Pokemon Go, okay? I'm getting somewhere here. So put your phones down, kids, who are using this right now. This is not a hot spot right now, okay? If you see anything around me, I'm going to kick it, right? But anyways, unlike the traditional video games where you would have to sit in your house and play video games and, you know, statistics came out, the kids were not being, uh, you know, they're not being uh, pushed to, to exercise, they're overweight, they're, they're, they're unhealthy. Well. This game has a lot of physical activity because people have to be on the go. They're everywhere. In fact, I was just at a park a few weeks ago, and I noticed, this is before I kind of realized what was going on, I noticed there were all these young adults walking around, jogging, riding their bikes, skateboards, walking, whatever, and they had their phones out, and it was the weirdest thing to see all these people doing this. And I'm like, okay, that's kind of odd. So I stopped a group of young kids. I said, hey, listen, what are you doing? He says, we're playing Pokemon Go. I'm like, that's crazy. In this entire park, people were there. And I found out that this game has these hotspots that you find. In fact, it uses Google Maps. It uses all these different things so you can go to these different places where you can find a lot of monsters and zap them. The weird thing is, is like people get so serious with this thing, and yet they're having a, bit, a lot of fun. Now, this reminded me of the Great Commission. Yes, that's right. Because, you see, a Pokemon player is considered a trainer. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, there's something interesting about this. And I'm like, that is almost like the Great Commission. Because the Great Commission, we have trainers in the Great Commission, and that is you and me. We're Christians, we're disciples, we're being trained, and we are also going out training others. And it's very interesting because the object of this game, this Pokemon Go game, they have a slogan that says this, gotta catch them all. I'm like, that's exactly what we're doing, right? We have to go catch those who are not saved and bring them into the kingdom of God. Obviously, we don't convert them, but we share the gospel with them. So I start thinking about all these things, and I'm like, wow, this is just like the Great Commission. 
because, like I said, Christians are trainers. We train others to follow Christ. And just like this Pokemon Go game, how exciting it is for many, how they're having so much fun, I'm thinking, the Great Commission is fun. I don't know why we make a big deal about the Great Commission. I want to dissect these two, three verses for you tonight to kind of show you what is this Great Commission. Because there are a lot of Christians today, they get scared when they hear the Great Commission. Because they're thinking, oh man, he's going to talk about missions, now I'm going to have to go out to Africa and really, you know, no, 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 listen, relax. We're not going there. We're going to look at this because I think this is very important for us to understand that when I look at the Great Commission, I see that this is a great adventure in a real world. It's not a game. It's actually real life. We're dealing with real souls. It's not an imaginary monster out there that we're trying to grab, even though some people kind of do look like monsters, right? They act like monsters. But we as Christians have an incredible opportunity to reach the lost. And, 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 and there's, there's, a, there's a joy in that. There's an adventure in that. There's an excitement in that. And you're going to see here why there's such a big excitement to the Great Commission. But chapter 28, Jesus has rose from the dead, and the conversation between Jesus and his apostles is jam-packed with important things for you and I to know about the Great Commission. And we see that the Great Commission stemmed from the heart of God. It wasn't something that Jesus just picked up from another rabbi. This came from the heart of God. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. From the heart of God came the Great Commission. And not only that, but Jesus was sent by the Father to earth to save sinners. And this is what it says in John 17, 18. Jesus says, as you, Father, sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. Jesus is sending us as he was sent. Do you see that whole progression? See, Jesus didn't just come here to die on the cross and then get back into heaven and say, okay, guys, we'll see you guys whenever you get up here. There's a job here for us. There, there, there's a duty here for us. And Jesus said there in John 17 that, just, Father, just like you sent me from heaven to earth, I am going to send my children to the world. The Great Commission was already preached way before Matthew 28. And it's interesting because what we see here is that the Great Commission is an exciting thing. So the questions that I'm going to answer tonight, questions that maybe you may have tonight, questions that are like, what is necessary to make me effective in making disciples of all nations? What are the ingredients? What are the qualifications? What are the dynamics in my life that will cause me to fulfill the Lord's command? Because inadequacy is what comes to our minds as Christians when it comes to witnessing and sharing the gospel. And, and some of you have fear when it comes to evangelism, and I'm hoping that at the end of this message, your fears will be calmed. In fact, you will have no fear, and when you walk out of this place, you're going to be like, I can't wait to go out there and find those sinners and bring them to Christ. And we see here very clearly that this great commission starts with one word in verse 18. Notice what it says. Jesus goes to his disciples, and he says, they immediately, or rather, I'm in the wrong uh, chapter here, actually, verse 18. It says, uh, Jesus said in verse 18, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He begins by telling them, I have authority in heaven and on earth. Now those words are very powerful because he's claiming authority. And this indicates that this is an authoritative command, not a suggestion. In other words, you've probably heard this, this is not the great suggestion. It's not that God is suggesting us to make disciples. It's something that he's calling us to do. It's a command. And we see that God is calling us to make disciples, and we also see here very clearly that Jesus has this plan for us. And as he went back into heaven, that's what he left us with. So what does that mean? What is the Great Commission? Well, before this, as a side note, notice there, the, 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 uh, the word all dominates these two verses. Notice it says all authority, all nations, all things, all the days. All dominates these verses. Jesus' authority was proven and proclaimed by his resurrection and ascension. 
Just what he did there showed some serious authority to overcome death. And not only that, but when Jesus lived on earth, a sinless life gave him a lot of authority. You know, God's authority is something that you see throughout the Old Testament. I mean, the very first thing we see when it comes to God's authority, we see that God gave Adam the authority over animals. First thing he saw there, we see there in, in Genesis. That God gave him that authority. You're the one running the garden. You're the CEO of this garden, Adam. The only thing is to stay away from that tree in the middle of the garden. Otherwise, this is yours. I've given you authority over it, over the animals. And he named the animals. God gave authority to Moses to go back to Pharaoh. When Pharaoh says, who do I say sent me? Jesus, or God said, tell him I am sent you under my authority. Go. It was a scary time for him, but he actually went. God gave Joshua the authority to lead the second generation into the promised land. Another man who was afraid. Joshua chapter 1, you see it many times. Do not be afraid. Be very courageous. Do not be afraid. We see that God gave him the authority to do it. When God gives you authority, do it. When he's behind it, you do it with confidence. You do it with boldness. In the New Testament, we see the authority of Jesus displayed in a variety of ways. Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan River. The heavens opened up, and then we hear the voice of God the Father saying, This is my Son, whom I am well pleased. His stamp of approval. He is authorizing the Son. This is the Messiah. Listen to him. The authority of Christ's. And as we see throughout the Gospels, we see that Jesus showed a variety of things proving his authority. Now, one thing that's interesting about Jesus is that Jesus never flaunted his authority. He didn't walk around saying, do you know who I am? Do you know what I can do to you? He didn't do that. He actually did not flaunt his authority. However, he didn't hide his authority either. Listen to this. When he was teaching Matthew 7, 20, 7, 29, it says, For he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. The teachings of Christ were with authority. And people recognized that authority, that he, was, he had something different. What he was saying was so different than those rabbis, than the scribes. And yet we see that Jesus did not hide that. In fact, the religious leaders questioned his authority. There, there was at one time when they came to Jesus and they said, by what authority do you do these things? You remember that? By what authority? They understood that you got some authority. He didn't flaunt it, but he didn't hide it. And it's interesting to me that Jesus made it very clear that he was basically over the things that are on this earth, the nature, the spiritual realm. And we see that throughout the Gospels. When Jesus came to this earth, he showed his absolute authority. He had authority over nature. He stopped the storm. He walked on water. He even had the authority to forgive sins, which almost got him killed for that. He was a man full of authority. When you think about somebody having absolute authority, it's kind of scary, isn't it? Somebody who has that much authority. I mean, we're dealing with that in our nation, globally. When there's a wicked leader, a government official who has this big authority, we get scared. We're like, what are they going to do? And you see, we see, though, that in the Scriptures, when Jesus was tempted in Matthew chapter 4, actually in Luke chapter 4, we see that Satan said something very interesting to Jesus to try to get him to bow down to him, basically to stop him from going to the cross. In Luke chapter 4, verse 6, Satan came to Jesus, and he said this, he, took, he takes him on a high mountain. He says, all this authority, he said, I will give to you and their glory, for this has been given to me. Interesting. And I give it to whomever I wish. Isn't it interesting? Satan says, I, all this is under my authority. Wow. Now, that is scary, right? That the devil has that authority. I would be afraid of that one. What happened there? Well, we know that Satan is the, the, the God of this age. He's the one who's working in the sense of disobedience. He's on a long leash. He's not like absolute authority there like Jesus is. But we see, though, in this world, obviously God is using him throughout this world, as you see in the book of Revelation. But yet we see, though, that 
Satan made it clear to Jesus that, hey, I have authority too. And of course, Jesus didn't give in to that temptation. With Jesus, you are safe when it comes to his authority. Because Jesus possessed all authority and he came here to serve people. Not to destroy people. Not to, you know, abuse people. Jesus came with that authority to serve you and I. Isn't that crazy? Satan, however, what, the way he uses his authority is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's how he uses his authority. But you see, Jesus doesn't do that. He came to save lives, not to destroy lives. And so Jesus here, we see very clearly, he says it right away. He says to them, all authority has been given to me. Notice he says there in verse 18, in heaven and on earth. And then he says something different. Notice in verse 19, he gets into this here now. He said, go therefore. Go therefore. What does that mean? Well, the go therefore phrase in the Greek, the idea here is not go on a mission trip. The idea here is not, is, is not just, just go out somewhere. Although it's not a bad idea to go on a mission trip. I mean, that's that, that's an important element within, within Christian, uh, within, our, within church. But this is a command to disciple as you are already going. What does that mean, Robert? Going where? Everywhere. Well, let me kind of break it down. The, the, the Greek phrase here, this sentence here, that the main verb is make disciples. It's not so much on the going, it's make disciples. That's the emphasis here that Jesus is making. And he's saying it here very clearly that when it comes to the words go, baptizing, and teaching, those describe aspects of the process of discipleship making or disciple making. So what is Jesus saying? He's saying this, while you are going through your daily routine, you, while you work at a grocery store, medical office, sales, doctor, lawyer, whatever you do, he says, as you are going on with that, as you're going along, doing what you do every day, he says, discipleize, make disciples. Pretty interesting. Because when we look at something like this, we're thinking, oh, that I have to go somewhere. I have to, you know, somehow, you know, buy a plane ticket and fly to another country or fly somewhere else and, and disciple people. Uh-uh, that's not what it's saying. See, the disciples were being basically set to go into Judea, Samaria, as we see in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. They were going to be going already. And Jesus says, okay, as you're going, disciple make disciples of all nations, as he's going to say here in a moment. Now, what is a disciple? Well, a good disciple is one who listens, understands, and obeys Jesus' instruction. That's a, that's a disciple. So, as Jesus is saying, we as disciples are to go and make disciples as we're going along our daily routine. Jesus says, make sure that you are teaching people, bringing them into the kingdom. You know, one of the things that we see in the book of Acts right away is that when the disciples were being persecuted by Saul, it says it very clearly in Acts chapter 8, verse 4, therefore those who were scattered went everywhere doing what? Preaching the word. There was no specific location. They were being persecuted. They just left. And it was like the Holy Spirit just scattered them. And as they went out, they didn't go out and hide. They went out preaching the gospel. They went out telling people about the gospel. That's, as they were going, that's what they were doing. And it's interesting that we see this very clearly, that instead of making evangelism a special separate part of our lives, what we should do here is make evangelism as an essential part of our lives, using whatever opportunities normally and naturally arise as we go about our daily services or routines. As you go to work tomorrow, you just open yourself up to the Holy Spirit. There's probably many people that don't know Jesus and probably a few that are ready to come to Christ. You don't have to leave. You can see the mission field right there. You know, in our church here, as you drive out, it says you're entering the mission field. Did you, did you, you know that? There's a, there's a sign there? I think that is so great. I think that's a great reminder. As you leave this church, hey, sometimes churches be, within themselves becomes missionary fields sometimes, you know what I'm saying? But, but as you leave, you're entering the mission field. I think that's well said. And, and this is what Jesus is communicating to his disciples. 
And he's telling them basically to, as you go, he says, make disciples. He says, reproduce yourself in others. You know, back in the 60s, they had this phrase, and I wasn't born in the 60s, but I know this is what they said. Keep the faith. Remember that? For those of you who were born in the 60s or lived around the 60s, keep the faith. Really, that's not Christianity. Give it out, right? We're not supposed to keep the faith. We're supposed to give it out. And we see here very clearly that as we reproduce ourselves in others, we want to bring people into the kingdom of Christ because of what God has worked in us already. Paul even said this in 1 Corinthians 11, 1. He says, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. That's pretty powerful. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. In other words, hey, listen, you want to hang out with me and all of that? That's great and all, but listen, I am not Jesus, but I'm imitating Christ. So as I imitate him, you imitate him too. I think that's cool to see this from Paul. That means that every person can participate in the Great Commission without ever going on a trip because we are all involved in the going. As you leave tonight's service, you're on the go. You don't know what God is going to do as you're heading out. Perhaps some of you are heading into a restaurant. Perhaps some of you are going back to work maybe tonight. You are going, and in that process of going, be ready to disciple people. Share the gospel. We see here that as you go about your business making disciples, this is basically the natural part of, a, of the Christian life. Jesus assumes you're going about your daily routine. Everybody here is busy. Everybody has a routine. Everybody has things that, are, that, that you're doing every day. And it's in, within, and in, in those things, Jesus says, disciple eyes. It's so easy to forget that. We go to work and we think, you know what, I'm working eight hours here and I don't even think of Christ. Perhaps it's because you're busy or not, I don't know. But sometimes we just don't think that way. We don't think that God can use me here at my job to lead people to Christ. And Jesus says, I have all authority in heaven and on earth. I can open up those doors. We've got to be careful that we don't limit God in what he wants to do. Each day... People who do not know Jesus will cross our path. And it should be an exciting thing. It shouldn't be something that we should fear. And we see here that this, this is something that we need to understand, that as we go about our day, be ready to make disciples. A great example is in Acts chapter 3. Peter and John. We see Peter and John were going to the temple at the hour of prayer. It was something that they did pretty much as a routine. And whether that man that was paralyzed, that was placed there at the entrance, was always there, or perhaps he was, you know, they went a certain way, and they ended up crossing his path. I don't know how it went, but I know that he was placed there, perhaps different sections in the temple, but most, most of the time it was at the entrance, because that's where everybody came in. And for some reason, the Holy Spirit spoke to Peter's heart, and at that time, that, that man was there, they crossed paths, that's when Peter said, I don't have money, but what I do have is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Get up and walk. And you know the story, right? How do you know that God is going to place somebody in your path who is ripe and ready to accept Christ? We don't know that. I remember one time I was at a youth group, and I was leading this youth group, and there was this dude that came in. He was, a, he was a, 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 an ex-ganger, or perhaps was still in gangs. He was scary looking. He was big. He was like this tall. I mean, this guy was pretty scary, and I just felt compelled to share the gospel with this guy. Even if he stabbed me or shot me, oh, well, here I go, right? So I just shared the gospel with this guy, and it took me like 30 minutes to articulate the truth of God to this man, to this young guy. And at the end of those 30 minutes, I kind of timed it, I said to him, so would you like to accept Jesus Christ into your life? He says, yeah, of course. What do you mean? I spent 30 minutes just talking to you. Was it that easy? I could have just said, hey, do you want to accept Jesus? And he would have probably done it right there. He says, I was already ready. See, we don't know the people that we cross paths, whether it's at work, whether it's in the grocery line, wherever it is, you don't know what that person's heart, where it's going, what's happening in there. And until we take that step to just evangelize them, encourage them, and once they come to Christ, you begin to make them disciples. You invite them to church. There's a discipleship class. There's the baptisms coming, and all of a sudden you're making disciples. And it becomes this, this exciting adventure. 
And this is what Jesus is telling the disciples. The word disciple, as I mentioned today earlier, literally means a learner. It denotes one who follows another's teaching. And a learner, a disciple, is always learning. We're always learning as Christians. God is always teaching us things. I'm always blown away when I read the scriptures or God reveals things to me. I'm, I'm still learning. And there's never going to be a day or, or a time that I'm going to get to a place in my walk with Christ where I'm going to know everything. Oh, I already know the Bible. I've gone through it already. I've taught. No, I, no, never. There's things that God still surprises me. I get excited about because as a disciple, you're always learning. And so what we do is we, we take what we've learned and we begin to disciple people. We begin to tell people about Christ. Discipleship or discipling means teaching people to observe that which Jesus has commanded. Now, the rest of the verse describes more of what it means to make disciples. And notice what he says. It says, baptize them. Baptize them, he said. The idea here is that I am to help people make a firm commitment to become a follower of Jesus Christ. Baptism does not save you. Baptism only confirms what God had already done in your life. You're, 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 you're publicly saying to those listening or watching that you are identifying with Jesus Christ, with his death, burial, and resurrection. So when people say, well, I don't want to be baptized, why wouldn't you want to identify yourself with Jesus? If you've already received Christ into your life, the next step is baptism. Because you're publicly saying to those watching, I am a follower of Jesus Christ's. And we see that the baptism that Jesus is referring to here is, has that idea. This is what happened with Philip when Philip, in Acts chapter 8, verse 26, when God led him in, uh, in that little road, that, that deserted road, he was heading in that direction, had no clue what was going on, and then all of a sudden, there's this Ethiopian eunuch in this chariot coming in from worship, and then the Holy Spirit says, go over, take that chariot. And then when he went over and to see what was going on, you guys probably know the story, this guy was reading the scroll of Isaiah. He had no clue what he was reading. And he even asked him, do you understand what you're reading? He says, I don't. How can I? And then it says that Philip preached Jesus to him from where he was at. Philip didn't preach a, a feel-good message or, or a positive thinking kind of message. He went right to the core, and that's Jesus Christ. And Philip was there, and then when Philip showed him that it was Christ in that verse, that man immediately received Christ, and then he says, what must I do to be baptized? And that's what he said, we'll believe in Jesus Christ, and he did right then and there, and then there was a puddle of water there, a, a thing of water, he says, well, there's some water there, let's do it, and he baptizes them right there. He made a disciple. That's pretty cool. Sunday, we're going to see a lot of people baptized. If you have not been baptized as a Christian, you've been a Christian for a while, and for whatever reason, you, maybe you haven't done it yet, your, upper, your, your, your chance, your opportunity is this Sunday night. Or, yeah, this Sunday night. You can get baptized. Identify yourself with Christ. There's no shame in that. And this is what he's telling them. He says, baptize them. And notice he says, in the name of the Father, the Son, and then the Holy Spirit. This literally says, into the name of. This is the Trinity here. This suggests coming into relationship with God as a disciple. Baptism indicates both coming into a covenant relationship with God and pledging submission to his lordship. And the cool thing about this, this uh, baptism into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is that the experience of God here is in these three persons is the essential basis of discipleship as, he's, as they're baptized into the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But notice what he says, though. He also says, he says, uh, I want to go back to it because I kind of missed this one. But he says, all authority has been given to me. Go there and make disciples. And notice he says, all nations. I want to, I want to, I want to hit that one real quickly because I, I didn't, I skipped it. Jesus here commands the making of disciples of individuals from all ethnic groups, including Judaism. And it has, all, it has always been God's heart. Always been God's heart or his desire to reach the world with all these lost sinners that are out there today. It's been his heart for the longest time. It's been his, the desire of God from the beginning that he wants to bring him into fellowship with God. How do I know that? 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 says this, God who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That is the heart of our God. 
And we as His people should have that same heart. Because that is His desire for everybody on this earth, is for them to come into that saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, into that relationship. It's about sharing Jesus with everyone if, and especially if, they are not like you. We shouldn't pick and choose who we want to share Jesus with. I know sometimes the person that cut you off, you're like, they can go to hell. We're like that sometimes. Or, or the person that's, you know, that, that's, that's annoying. He's like, well, I'm not going to share the gospel with them. Oh, well, they're going to miss out. That's not the way it should be. It doesn't matter. We have been commanded to share the gospel with everyone. It doesn't matter whether they look like you or not, whether they are weird, geeky. It doesn't matter. That person, that individual, that soul is important to God. And it's an important concept. It's an important thing here for us to understand here that this is about sharing Jesus with everyone. And the cool thing about this is that you can do it in your own hometown. You can do it wherever you're at, whether you're at school, at work. In fact, there's probably many ethnic groups in your, own, in your town. Hey, even, in the, even if there's a Muslim living next door, don't, don't be afraid of them. Share the gospel with them. I remember when I was at Bible college many years ago, uh, the mosque here, there's a Muslim mosque up here, I was in Bible college, and you know, as, as a young guy, I remember going to Bible college, you know, you're, you're getting puffed up with knowledge, right? You're thinking you're like John the Baptist, right? You're ready to go to Central and just start preaching the gospel to people off of Central, you know what I'm saying? So I remember my friend and I were like, you know what, we were studying world religions here at the, at the, the church here with one of the classes, and I said, you know what, there's a mosque down there, let's go evangelize these guys. And little did I know about, you know, Islam, I just, we went out there and and uh, we wanted to evangelize them, and also we wanted to obtain a Quran because we wanted to study the Quran. And so we walked into this mosque, and we were like the only two students in this mosque. We're walking around. I, I think we, I mean, we, we were there. Nobody was around, and we were like kind of like in this hallway that it was echoey, and we're just saying, hello, hello, and, and it was just like nobody was there, and I'm thinking, we're trespassing right now. We're going to get in trouble. So as we're walking through, my friend said, let's just keep going. No, there's a library here. So we went in there, and as we see up in their shelf, all these Qurans. Well, that's what we need. And so he says, no, don't take it. Let's find somebody. So as we walk back out, out of that, uh, that, that uh, library, we hear a voice, can I help you? Like, oh, dude, we're in trouble now. We're just Bible college students from Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley. We just want a Quran. Well, come in first to my office. Like, we're dead. So here we walk into the office, and this is, this is the, the, uh, the, the head of the mosque, and we sit down with him, and, and we just, him and I, my friend, we just start sharing Jesus with this guy. It's like, well, you know, we just want to share about Jesus with you. Oh, we believe in Jesus. We love Jesus. No, no, no. You say he's a prophet, uh, just one of the prophets. We believe Jesus is the Messiah. And we went back and forth, back and forth, and then they bring in food for us, and I don't know the culture, and my friend's like, oh, good, food. I said, no, don't eat it. <laughs> I said, you serious? I said, we're going to be the first martyrs here in Chino. <laughs> I didn't know the culture. That was what they do. They feed you. I'm like, I'm not going to have that. So my friend's like eating it up. I'm like, oh, I'm out of here, you know? We went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth with this guy. And we didn't go anywhere, but, but we shared the gospel with him. I mean, it would have been easy for me to say, oh, no, they're, they're Muslims. I'm not going to go there and share the gospel. Forget them. No, we're to share the gospel with everybody. Even the neighbor that bothers you, we're to share the gospel with. Because that is our command. That's what Jesus is calling us to do. And so he tells us not only to baptize them, but notice teaching. Notice what it says. The word teaching here has the idea of conveying theology, the things Jesus taught, and living the things I am teaching. In other words, I'm to model obedience. Listen, guys, if you're a Christian and you're working and you're not modeling obedience to Christ, they're not going to want to listen to you. If you're cussing and swearing and laughing at their jokes and stealing and, and just being dishonest, listen, when they find out you're a Christian or if they already know you're a Christian, they're going to look at you as a hypocrite or a phony. Discipleship won't work there. We have to model obedience. What does that mean? That we show that we have integrity in our walk with Christ, that we do go to church, and, and that we're not like them. 
And, and we see here that when Jesus says teaching them, he says not only teach them doctrine, but also model obedience, because that's the way they're going to become effective disciples. Any proclamation of the gospel which does not have Christ at the center is not the gospel. And if that's what our lives are kind of showing at work, then that is not the gospel message. And we see here that disciples here must not just, uh, must not just understand what Jesus has commanded, as, as foundational as this is, they must also obey it. So when we teach them, we also want to teach them to obey, to obey. I remember discipling this young guy many years ago. He struggled with smoking pot. And I said to him, and he just got saved. I said, listen, dude, you got to get off of that. And he says, but, but, but Robert, you don't understand. Every time I smoke weed, man, I get this boldness. Is that from the Holy Spirit? I said, no, it's from the, the drug. <laughs> but I just, I, I can share Jesus with these guys when I'm smoking pot. I said, dude, listen, you're deceived. That is not good. If you're sitting there smoking a joint with your friends, they're not going to take you serious. You're not modeling obedience. And so when we see this here, this is an important thing because obedience is so important in the Christian life. Jesus even said this in Luke 6, 46. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? That's very convicting, isn't it? Listen, we're not going to be living a perfect life on this side of heaven. I'm not preaching perfection here because none of, a, none, none of you here, including myself, are perfect. And you're not going to experience perfection on this side of heaven until you get to heaven. But we strive to live a pure life. We strive to live an obedient life in Christ's. It's a believing learner, one who places faith in Christ and who follows in a life of learning the disciple. It's a beautiful word. And, and a lot of you here tonight who are born-again Christians, you are disciples. Begin to reproduce yourself in others. Begin to share what, what you've learned about Christ from this pulpit, from your devotional life, and begin to go out and, and bring that over to somebody who's ready to receive Jesus Christ. Of course, we're not going to go out there and shove it to people that don't want it, but there are many people out there, I guarantee you, Jesus even said that there are a lot of sheep out there, and the laborers are few, he said, that there are people that are ready, ready to get right with God. And, and we see here that Jesus is encouraging the disciples to go out and this great commission. But notice the final component of the great commission in verse 20. He said this. He says, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What does that mean? It means this, that I am not on my own in the great commission. I am not on my own in the great commission. That's what it says right here. You see, you and I need the power of the Holy Spirit to disciple, to make disciples. We are not alone in this process, in this adventure. Jesus joins you in your going, your baptizing, and in your teaching as you disciple others. He's with you. And that's the cool thing about this, is that Jesus Christ says, I'm not detaching myself from you. I'm going to be with you. I'm not leaving you alone. You need my power. Acts 1.8, I, I said it earlier, right? when it says that, that Jesus said, oh, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be witnesses to me. Not that you're going to go out and witness. You're going to be witnesses. This is who you are with the Holy Spirit living in you. He says, throughout all these areas, Judea, or Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, as you're going, he says, you're going to just be lighting up the world. Like Jesus said in Matthew 5, right? You are the light of the world. Listen, you are, not that you're going to become. You don't wake up in the morning and turn on a switch. Okay, I'm a light today. You are, that's who you are in Christ. Now, it depends on you how bright you shine. That's on you. Christ is already living in you. He's ready to just shine. But we're the ones that control that, depending on our obedience, disobedience, grieving the Spirit. Let me close with a few final thoughts. One is that you are already going. You're a busy person. You're, you have your daily routine. You don't need to go anywhere else on planet Earth to fulfill the Great Commission. You can start that at work. 
perhaps at school, everywhere. The street you live, the town you live in, your workplace, your sphere of influence are the places where you are already going. Make disciples, Jesus would say, in those places. You are on an exciting mission with Jesus, who is with you as you do what he has commanded. You're not alone. It's an exciting journey. It's an exciting task. Because this hopefully removes the pressure of evangelism. When you hear evangelism, when somebody comes up and preaches on evangelism, a lot of you are like, oh, I don't like talking about Jesus to people I don't know, you know, or street evangelism. I've done that before. I've gone door to door knocking here at the church. It's not comfortable for me to get the door shut in your face to say, no, thank you. You want to open it up and say, wait a minute, you know, but then you go to jail. But when you, th when you think about evangelism, a lot of people say, oh, no, 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 I'm not a call, I'm not an evangelist. No, Greg Laurie, no, 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 Raul Reese, no, no, no. I'm not like those guys, no, no, no. I, 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 listen, this is not about that. This is about wherever you go, you're making disciples. You're sharing the gospel with people on an individual ba basis. Discipleship is more than just going to Starbucks. Because sometimes we look at discipleship, oh, yeah, I've been discipling this guy. Oh, yeah, well, well, tell me about the subject. Well, he likes macchiato or caramel macchiato. And, um, you know, no, 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 that, that's not discipleship. You mean you're not reading the Bible with them or you're not teaching? No. No, no. But the coffee's good. That's not discipleship. Starbucks not discipleship. Unless you have a Bible open and you're teaching them. I've discipled a lot of people. Some that were, you know, fruitful. Others were not fruitful because, one, they did not want to obey what was being taught. I remember I spent about eight months with one young guy meeting him at the public library, going through the Gospel of John with him because he showed interest in Jesus. I said, great, let's go to the library, let's meet there at 6 o'clock, one day a week, and we will go through the Gospel of John. You can ask all the questions that you have, and, and, and you know what, I will teach you about Jesus. And I did that for eight months. It didn't work. Why? Because he did not want to obey the things of Christ's. In fact, he did come to the Lord, but for some reason, there was a glitch there in his life that he did not want to obey the Lord. I've had other discipleship opportunities where they just grew. In fact, many years ago, I remember discipling this another young guy. I, I, in New York, I pastored a church in upstate New York. That's why I have all these experiences when it comes to discipleship. And I did a lot of young adult things with, with uh, groups, that is, and, and teens. And I remember one specific teen I remember he was so messed up on drugs. He was just struggling with God. And I remember spending time with him, too. It didn't go anywhere. I was so bummed. I moved back to California. And four or five years later, I get a call from this kid, now 20 years old, saying to me, you know what? I know that we spent time together for a while. You're reading the Bible, encouraged me to listen to Jesus, to walk with him and whatnot. I was listening to you. But I was in a hard spot. But I want to tell you today, I am following Jesus Christ. The fruit came later. It's frustrating at first where you're like, I'm wasting my time. But you know what? It's not, it's not, your, it's not my time. It's God's time. And this young boy blew me away when he said this. And here's another one. Recently, my wife and I were at home, and I get this phone call from this this young girl who was in college when I was pastoring there, who we invited to church, we, we encouraged her, we shared the, the Lord with her. She didn't come to Christ, and she called us about three weeks ago from New York, and we haven't even seen this girl for six years, and she's crying on the phone, telling her, my wife and I, I just want to thank you guys for what you said to me and the things you taught me. I just came to Jesus, and she just started crying, and she, I'm like, wow, that's so awesome. So the person you just shared Jesus with today at work, don't be, a, don't, don't be bummed out that they looked at you and said, you're crazy. Because you don't know what will happen down the road. They may be calling you saying, thank you for telling me that Jesus loves me. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He, is, he has absolute authority, guys. Rest in that. Be encouraged. Because the Great Commission here is a wonderful task. It's an exciting journey that God has given you and I the opportunity 
to make disciples of all nations. Amen?